On today's episode of Still Processing a 76ers podcast, we welcome in a brand new addition to the Still Processing family here, familiar face and voice to some. We take a look back on Joel Embiid's franchise scoring record 70 points against the San Antonio Spurs, and we talk about the return of an old friend to the NBA coaching landscape. All that and more on today's episode of Still Processing, a 76ers podcast. All right, hello and welcome to another episode of Still Processing of 76ers Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Chavalella, and you will see here for those watching on YouTube that I'm not here with my normal co-host, Justin Crosby, but I'm actually here with good friend of the pod, really good friend of the pod, Mr. Sam DiGiovanni. Sam, how you doing today, man? I am doing great, Zach. I am happy to be here with you. Plenty of interesting stuff in the NBA and Sixer Circles to talk about recently. Very happy to join longtime listener, first time uh, hearer, <laughs> I guess, but I'm, I'm super pumped, man. Yeah, no, we're super excited to have you. This is something uh, that basically I've wanted to have Sam on as a guest for, for a very long time, and I've procrastinated to no end. And uh, next thing you know, Sam and I are just having a conversation at, at one of the uh, recent Sixers games when we're that down there on the media media row media section and uh, next thing you know Sam is now and I can finally announce this super excited about this officially joining the podcast completely skipping right over guest going right into new co-host alongside myself alongside Justin Crosby and we now have a three-headed monster for the still processing 76ers podcast so super exciting could not be happier can't wait for the rest of this season, how this is going to go ahead. I think this is going to be great, uh, not only for, for ourselves. I think it's going to be great for all the listeners out there. Sam, uh, longtime Sixers writer who uh, – really, Sam, I, I guess there's no one better to speak about your body of work other than yourself. So why don't you kind of introduce yourself, reintroduce yourself to anyone listening as far as what you have done so far with the Sixers and what you've done also as a member of the PSN family as well. So people who consume the fantastic content we do here at PSN probably have seen my byline on some Philly stuff uh, after complaining about the offseason, literally inventing a little generator to make some stuff up. Finally, some actual stuff has happened, both the Phillies doing something and a beloved former Philly Reese Hoskins going elsewhere. So I've written some stories about the Phils and their, uh, their offseason slash kind of looking ahead to um, next season a little bit. Um, I cover the clutch points. Um, geez, what a start. I cover the Sixers as the <laughs> four clutch points. I'm the Sixers beat writer over there. This is my second uh, season on the beat. Uh, I've kept up with the Sixers uh, over the years, and, and there's all, uh, always so much to keep up with them there. Grew up um, in the area, went to graduated from CB East High School in 2018. Um, and for the second season in a row, I've had a front row seat, uh, technically a last row seat in the media row, but still pretty close to, uh, the Sixers. Uh, and I've had the fantastic chance to meet people like Zach and Justin and plenty of others and being here and having the chance to talk about them more regularly. In addition to writing about them all the time, uh, is very, very exciting. So I'm really, really excited to get started. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Obviously, uh, you know Sam and I, and and Justin as well. Uh, really, all kind of started this Sixers uh, beat journey, as you will, kind of around the same time. Uh, obviously, I've you know been writing for PSN for a number of years, but as far as uh, in person media attendance for PSN, as many of you may know, that started for us as well last year. Uh, I've had the opportunity to get to know Sam a little bit since then. Uh, as luck would have it, we are now buddies in that back row with the media section. So uh, typically get to throw around uh, one or two sarcastic comments throughout the game, each uh, each given home game. So it's a good time for, for all. 
And uh, now we're going to have a good time on the podcast, too. So we're super excited to have Sam. Really excited for what the future holds for this podcast. And uh, really just excited about some Sixers basketball. And what is more exciting in the world of Sixers basketball than Joel Embiid's performance Monday night against the San Antonio Spurs. If you missed it, you're an absolute moron. And I say that as the guy who did not go to the game Monday night, skipped the Spurs game, and missed Joel Embiid's 70-point performance. So, Sam, for for everyone and, and, and for myself, again, being the moron who did not show up to the game, tell me a little bit what it was like to watch Joel put up 70 in a game on Monday night. It's cool. Great. All right. All right so, great. Uh, we'll just... see you guys next week on the pod. <laughs> yeah, and, <that's> uh... <laughs> um, so, I mean, it really, I, the stage was very similar to the game Joel had last year, his 59 point outing near quadruple double against the jazz, where it was obviously an intense game against, you know, a team that the Sixers were expected to be, but they had gotten a pretty good game out of their opponent. Um, and the, the noise in the arena as Joel was approaching, making history, approaching it was just fantastic. Um, the expectation, obviously, was that they were going to kind of wipe the floor with the Spurs. Uh, as fantastic as Victor Wembanyama has been in his rookie season, that Spurs team is very bad. Last I checked, third worst record in the league, employing one point guard despite having arguably one of the very best lob threats in the league. A lot of young guys trying to figure some stuff out. So, um, and you know, obviously, Joel has had a lot of great starts throughout games um has had 20 point quarters before um but came out you know first quarter i think it was 24 i want to say which like you know run of the mill you kind of expected that it was uh, apparent that try as Wemby did uh he just did not have the physicality to match up with Embiid. he made a lot of sacrifices in terms of you know contesting his jumper for making sure he didn't get ran through um, and so Joel just worked his way all night, no matter how uh, tall Wemby reached with his ridiculous arms, and he was able to get those jumpers over him super easily. Worked his way up, run of the mill again, second quarter, hit the ground running again. Um, and the third quarter, at least, is when I started to notice that, like, you know, it really is becoming the Embiid show. And, like, obviously it always is. He Everything goes through him on the team on both ends. But offensively, especially it felt like the Sixers knew like, okay, he's on a, he's a man on a mission. Like he's, he's in this groove. The Spurs can't guard him and they just kept feeding him. And he worked his way up to a new career or tying his career high 59 by the end of the third. And as he approached, I think I first noticed, I'm like, Holy crap, this man's ridiculous. He had like 40 and then he got to 50 with like a bunch of minutes left in the third. And, you know, you just feel the energy in the building continue to rise up. Uh, the Sixers had the lead for, I won't say most of the game, but the Spurs, you know, they played well, especially at the start, and that kind of helped keep it kind of close. And then he hit the, I want to say the three-pointer to make it 59 at the end of the third. And then I was kind of myself doubting, like, oh, man, how, how much is he really going to go? Like, you know, we've seen not just games where Embiid um, is able to put the other team away, like, before the third but even when they're not totally away Tyrese can usually take the torch and go right off himself and lead it to a point where he's able to rest for you know that last stretch of the fourth quarter or whatever so I was thinking I'm like okay this first team really isn't that good if Tyrese comes out you know and he was all he was solid um if he comes out and just puts them away then Embiid's gonna end it at 59 which would I mean obviously it's always impressive but the Spurs kept it close enough to where Embiid coming back in made total sense and uh, they just kept going to him the rest of the way. Um, super, super loud cheers for the big man as he continued to rain in jumper after jumper, getting right to the rim. Um, and I think the loudest was when he finally was able to check out with some, you know, somewhere around a minute left. Um, you know, he got into the 60s to get his first 60 point game, and then he had that breakaway layup to get to 70. Obviously, super loud cheers there, um, with just a ridiculous stat line. And uh, I think a few possessions later or so he comes out and the arena really starts to get loud knowing that he broke in Wilt's franchise record, knowing that he just became the ninth player, I believe to score 70 in a game um, for all the great games that Joel's had for him to, you know, 
write his name in the record books the way that he did and just completely own the game from start to finish. I mean, we've seen his growth over the years, but it really is just, you know, it's, I feel like it's never been more appropriate to call him a cheat code. And watching that game, watching how easily he can get into his jumpers, watching how automatic he is, not just drawing fouls, but making his free throws. He is a phenomenal foul shooter. Um, really, really a special game from Embiid and one that I was very fortunate to be in, not to rub it in your face at all, but I was yeah. fortunate. Once in a lifetime, as they say, I guess just not my lifetime. So uh, I was at home watching along every little bit of the way. And uh, it, it just felt, and this is crazy to say about a 70 point performance, it felt easy. It felt completely within control. And obviously, that night, one of the other major storylines across the NBA was the performance Carl Anthony Towns put up with 62 points which is in and of itself crazy. And it started with an incredibly hot shooting start from three. I think he started off eight of 10 from three. And when you kind of look at the two scoring performances side by side, there's a very noticeable difference. And what Towns did, absolutely impressive. I'm not necessarily trying to take away from him, but there's a lot more of that forced feeling coming from Towns' performance. You see a lot more of that that shot chucking, uh, especially when you consider, well, one of the key differences is that, well, Joel Embiid is the center point of this offense for Philadelphia. Carl Anthony Towns is not inherently that. That's supposed to be Anthony Edwards, effectively, who was having an off night. Carl Anthony Towns took over. It is what it is. On top of that, just by playing his game, that kind of... Working down low, obviously, but living and dying in the mid range, uh, really just living that night. And of course, at the free throw line, you mentioned that earlier, it was just an absolutely incredible performance from the line. I know people don't like to hear that, but 21 to 23 from the line, you, you got to give him his flowers for that. It's just, <laughs> I, I know that there's all people the, won't, the, but they should. There's no reason not to. Yeah, there's all the especially foul in 70 talk, point games, and, everyone's drawing a bunch of fouls. It's Exactly, exactly. And if you look at these high point performances historically, like that's that's exactly the case. Even Wilt's hundred point game, you think he got there yeah, like thirty six free throws? I mean, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So uh, for for Joel to get to the line twenty three times, I mean, you have NBA players who do that, and they're putting up points in the thirties. Uh, thinking about Giannis, so uh, just the fact that he's making these free throws makes all the difference. And I think that. And this is not a unique perspective. I think that's part of the reason people have a problem with Joel taking these this many free throws is that he's actually making it. Nobody said anything when you know Hack Ben was a thing, Hack Dwight, whatever the case may be. Andre Drummond Hacka can Giannis shoot a billion now. free throws. Hack Giannis now doesn't matter if you can't make the free throws, but if you can, well now there's a problem. So uh, in any case, just a really special night from Embiid, and and again it, it felt effortless for most of the night. There was that recognition from the team kind of in that third quarter, like you said, where there was that concept. Everybody except Daniel House could feel it, that this was on the precipice. Him getting booed is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in an NBA game, man. Just so. I heard oh, I heard so Adam Aronson, uh, you know, affectionately known as Sixers Adam, uh, Philly voice, talking about it on the Jody Mack show the other night, actually. And uh, I, I wanted a chance to, to – you know, again, get that insight into what it was like. I've been going through withdrawal, dude, just not going to this game. Every time I don't go, he does something crazy like this. And this is obviously the epitome of it. Uh, so I'm trying to live vicariously through whoever I can. And hearing Sixers Adam talking about how badly Daniel House was booed in those moments, it just, I, I love this fan base. I think that uh, there's there's no crowd like a Philly crowd. And I've been able to, experience where where we sit in the media section being so close and and you know to the center of the seats. action they're they're great seats you can't beat the seats but one of my favorite things this season and particularly this season because just the general vibes have been better not just around the team but around the fans as well the atmosphere that the fans are bringing is absolutely fantastic the 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 game just last week against the Denver Nuggets, uh, Joel versus Jokic. That that had a real playoff feel to the game, and it was 
incredibly intense. There was a packed house. And I, I just really can't put into words other than a playoff atmosphere, how intense it was and how great the fans were that night. So for, for them in the midst of this historic performance of Joel Embiid to boo Daniel house, because he is Daniel housing all over the court is the most beautifully Philadelphia thing that I can think of. People love to talk about snowballs at Santa Claus for getting context and everything like that. And that's not Philly fans. What What is Philly fans is loving. And it is lovingly. Don't get me wrong. Like there's, there's a lot of it. That's like you idiot. Give the ball to Joel. But at the same time, the people love Daniel house. Uh, to This is quintessential Philadelphia. This, this moment of, you know, get this man, the ball he's, he's making history. Uh, and it, it just it, it speaks volumes to to Philadelphia, the character of Daniel House. Daniel House is is I love Daniel House. I love D House on this team, and he's just a total great vibes guy. And even not being on the same page, I think that still kind of helps the vibes in a sense because it kind of creates this whole story as well. Uh, so this this team just the, the again the atmosphere around them, it's contributed to the atmosphere around the fans being much better this year than last year as well, uh, and and just the overall vibes out of philly are, are so much better especially coming off of this 70 point performance which uh, the man better get 71 that's 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 it i just need him at the next home game to get 71 i guess that's my only way that i'm ever going to get over missing this game but uh truly special no player has ever scored 70 points pulled down eight, 18 rebounds and dished five assists in a single game he is the only player in nba history to do that that is Absolutely incredible. And I think the other stat was the only player to score 60 points, uh, have 15 rebounds and five assists. It's Joel Embiid and Michael Jordan, I believe, was the was the other notable stat. When you looked at there were so many of these of these stats related to his performance this past Monday. And a lot of the names that you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of mention of Wilt Chamberlain, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. And to to do this in this game, especially on the anniversary of Kobe's 81 point game. I mean, I'm surprised Joel Embiid didn't just shout out Jalen Rose right after the game. You know, we've seen comments about that in the past, but uh, just, just a special night for a special player. His journey has been, uh, I, I can't wait to read the book that comes out after his career, because from, uh, from, from his earliest stages playing basketball, which is far later than most any other NBA player to now, the immense growth that we've seen and who knows where this ends. Obviously people are always going to say, I need to see it in the playoffs. Well, you can't see it in the playoffs until the playoffs are here. So for right now, I'm just going to enjoy the greatness that has been Joel Embiid's regular season. In my eyes, he's the clear cut MVP. And it's, it's honestly just uh, refreshing to see such a complete well-rounded game uh from really anyone in the nba but especially Embiid, it's great to see so uh super exciting obviously the 70 point performance this season in totality so far has been fantastic the other big sixers news <laughs> is not even sixers news uh is what's been really interesting around the nba obviously we're getting closer to the trade deadline the all-star break everything such as that uh and and that's all well and good i feel like the trade deadline, there's only so much that you can speak about right now just because uh, Daryl Morey, the guy that he is, we know that he prefers to make those deals a little bit closer to the deadline. There's uh, a little bit of rumors here, there, everywhere about what might be happening, what might not be. Uh, the All-Star game, I think we all kind of expect Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey to be involved. Other than that, there not really too many expectations. So it's a little bit dry, especially with the game gap right now in the Sixers schedule. Well, then next thing you know, the Milwaukee Bucks, the team with the second best record in the NBA, second seed in the Eastern Conference, they decide to go and they fire their head coach, Adrian Griffin, in a move that is both surprising and unsurprising when you take a look at the complete context of their situation in Milwaukee. But then they add another interesting wrinkle to it on top of that, and the word is that they, or at least the man at the top of their list eventually, and then yes, they did agree to terms of who they wanted to bring in, being former Sixers head coach and 
well, I guess now former ESPN broadcaster, Doc Rivers. So Adrian Griffin out, Doc Rivers in, just about smack dab halfway through the season. <laughs> Where were you when that news broke, Sam? And and what was your immediate takeaway, not only of, of Griffin's firing, but on Doc Rivers being decided to be the man to lead the Bucks to where they want to go. So I think I was just on my couch. I was somewhere here at home procrastinating uh, an article, some some po- more post game coverage, <clears throat> and I was stunned. Um, I had known that one, the Bucks were doing well, but that it was a bit of a facade. Um, that you know they had figured some stuff out, but that the top the top coaching choice from Giannis hasn't really worked out all that well I wasn't totally aware of the beef slash strife the team had with the coach um I'd like kind of seen it in passing on Twitter or whatnot um and I had known that you know they were in a situation where things were getting rocky and despite the talent that they have despite them being one of the best offenses in the league they were really bad on defense and it seemed like you know the, uh, the the comparison that I've seen it's close to home here is that they are this year's Eagles team uh, in terms of how much they get by on talent and how the record and things look good, but that underneath the hood, things are not as clean. So seeing them fire Adrian Griffin, he was, his record was stunningly close to that of David Blatt, the former Cavs head coach who was fired halfway through their title run. I think his record was 30, 11 Griffin, 30 and 13 which, you know, they've been the second seed in the East for a while. And to then, that that was shocking to me. Then to see, I think he was the first name mentioned, and it makes sense because he is the guy that now has the job, seeing that Doc Rivers is the guy that is potentially going to replace him, I immediately was, like, my eyes, like, lit up. I was like, oh, this (laughs) is too freaking good man i i saw it and i said like i need it i just need to see that man it was so freaking funny then the reporting came out about how he has been informally advising adrian griffin and yep. the bucks decided that the student is no good so they want the teacher who has helped the student reach results and not be you know a super good influence does not make a lot of sense but the NBA, if it is a basketball league second and a soap opera first, and it is absolutely the, this whole saga has been just some unbelievable stuff. Doc, while working for one of the league's premier broadcasting partners in uh, talking about a team or talking to a team, helping them out, it's one thing. And we were actually um, when I got to Sixers practice today before. Um, it was open to the media. Uh, You know, some of the reports were talking about it and it was just such a weird angle to consider that this guy is working for the league, but still like, you know, helping out one specific team. And there is such a line, you know, if you're advising someone, you know, if you're giving some advice just here and there, that's something, but being a legitimate, like consultant, I think was the word used that is pretty, seems to be crossing a line. And all this is just so extremely funny that he is coming, you know, he, it it was interesting to see, you know, after he was fired from the Sixers, there was a lot of like kind of speculation. Like, okay, he had, he came out one last thing. It didn't work out. Now he'll go, you know, chill and do what he wants to do. But the man is just addicted to coaching. It is just fascinating to see. And I am super fascinated to see how this Bucks team uh, does the rest of the way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for a man who loves golfing as much as Doc Rivers does, retirement clearly does not uh, sit well with him. So uh, had to to get back to that coaching search. Didn't want to coach for just any team. Needed the right opportunity, obviously, if he was going to give up uh, whatever it was he was doing with ESPN. I know he was part of the broadcasting team, but it seemed like he was selectively uh, a part of the team, whatever the case may be. Uh but you listen, at the end of the day, game recognized game, and you gotta you gotta give it up to Doc for consulting Griffin right to the unemployment line. It was uh definitely an impressive masterclass uh of, of Game of Thrones level deception. But uh now he's he's the head honcho there in Milwaukee. 
We'll see how Giannis and Dame and, and everyone react there. Uh, the issues with Griffin may not have been overly televised effectively, but uh, they, they they were there. I mean, Terry Stotts at the beginning of the year quit. Huge red, on, flag. huge red flag. <laughs> huge red flag. Based on an interaction between he and Griffin, uh, he had an interaction at practice that obviously – snowballed not long after that uh damian lillard pretty big fan of terry stotts a lot of experience with him so uh not really the best way to to win lillard over Giannis, who had given the seal of approval for griffin over nick nurse mind you as well uh yeah not really feeling griffin by the end of the tenure there uh we've seen the on the court spats everything such as that and yeah, it, it was not it was not a great situation in Milwaukee to see them move on from Griffin again is not overly surprising to see Doc Rivers be the guy that they've decided is the perfect fit to bring them back to the NBA Finals. A little bit more surprising, but when you look at his uh his historic coaching record, you know, through when you just look at the surface level of it, like who who who's a better available coaching candidate? than Doc Rivers in that sense. Like ignoring the second round foibles again and again and again and the lack of adjustments and uh, the traditional stubbornness and the poor media relationship and everything like that. Forgetting all of that, the man won a ring in 2008. So so there's that. Uh, he he is has been considered by some to be a top 15 coach of all time. He has worked with plenty of stars in the past to help uh, to help get him there, and and he's working again with Giannis and with Dame. So, uh, opportunity to again build those star relationships, and they're hoping that he can really kind of turn that defense around in Milwaukee. It's one of the worst defensive teams that the Bucks have seen in the established Giannis era, at least we'll say. And as much as Adrian Griffin did have an impact on that, a negative impact on that. We cannot ignore the fact that they also moved on from Drew Holiday, Javon Carter, and even Grayson Allen, and instead brought in Damian Lillard, Campaign, and Malik Beasley. Now, Sam, I'm I'm I might be crazy. Please let me know if I am crazy. Is it at all possible that moving on from Drew Holiday, Javon Carter, and Grayson Allen? For Damian Lillard, Campaign, and Malik Beasley could possibly, just possibly, have a negative effect on the perimeter defense of the Milwaukee Bucks. Is that crazy, or is there a method to that madness there? It is not a crazy thing to say. <clears throat> and the the view when it happened, I mean, you know, it was obviously very late in the offseason, but the the understanding was, okay, Drew is obviously a great defender, but he's questionable on offense, particularly in the playoffs. And Dame is such an upgrade over him just as in terms of overall impact and especially what he can do on offense with his shooting that it was clear the Bucks were looking to make a trade-off. And it obviously happened with their other moves. Javon Carr is a really solid defender. Grayson Allen can, you know, can hold his own. And, you know, replacing who they had with who they – um who they got again like there was a I do see like the the method to the madness of wanting to get that trade off of offense particularly obviously with the the dame over drew but I think you know having the not so great um personnel and Chris Middleton's decline has been very has been more negatively impactful than previously thought um they do have a rookie point guard, Andre Jackson. I really hope I'm not sure. Who is, I, I think, but. a stud, Andre Jackson. Mm -hmm. I think he will be very good. But again, he is a rookie. Yeah, that is when he's the guy that's providing a lot of that defensive juice and he's coming along as a rookie in a team that is established, that is looking to make an impact now, it's tougher to – play a guy whose defense is really good, but whose offense the coaching staff is still trying to figure out and isn't as 
certain about how it will fit around their franchise star. See Springer, Comet, Jaden um, with the Sixers example. So, yeah, the, the personnel, like you said, I mean, it makes sense that their perimeter defense has, you know, taken a step back. Uh, and their offense hasn't been as explosive enough to cover up those downsides. And again, that was probably like a, a side reason um, that Griffin was shown the door. I think a lot of it was just that he lost the team before the all-star break, oh, which is very sure. tough to do. Yeah. And if a coach loses, especially a team with serious championship aspirations, you, you, you can't lose the team. And uh, everyone's saying, you know, credit the Milwaukee Bucks for making the change when they did. I mean, sure. Like, listen, I I could go on and talk about how, well, there were plenty of red flags before they made the hire. So, you know, how much can you really credit them? But there is, yes, that baseline of, well, at least they stopped the bleeding. And you do have to give it to them. They opened themselves. Yes, they did stop the bleeding of their self inflicted. Cleaned up your own mess. It's like you said, it's hard (laughs) to credit them too much. Like, it's, yeah, they didn't exactly cost fallacy. They moved on when they thought the time was right instead of, you know, seeing what happened. Like, yeah, it is, you know, if that is the mind thing you can give them credit for is like, okay, they knew it was not working out and they decided not to be complacent. You gave yourself a paper cut and you put a bandaid on it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. But again, the personnel issues and, and to be clear, the Damian Lillard trade, I think you make 10 times out of 10 because we all saw how the bucks were during the playoffs they needed that type of offensive creation that Damian. Well, I mean, <laughs> they didn't necessarily need what Damian Lillard brings to the table, but that's like an embarrassment of riches, or riches when you have a guy like Damian Lillard that you can bring into the team. So to bring in somebody like that, obviously, is is even still a great move there. But where the issue lies is not in balancing the roster thereafter, and it's a very tough position they're in, both with the new CBA lack of draft picks, lack of salary to acquire free agents. So it's it, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But that just goes to show that perhaps they won't be able to solve their defensive issues just by adding Doc Rivers. Maybe it could get better. I I think that Bucks fans should temper their expectations somewhat though, uh as far as what they expect there. I think more so the focus should be and you spoke about this earlier Sam, but about Doc being able to gain the locker room and their trust and being able to just connect that locker room. And really the only connection in the Bucks locker room was against Adrian Griffin. And that's a problem. So uh, going forward, if this team can kind of rally around Doc, who at times has been known as a player's coach, they especially love his uh, practice habits, I'll say. Uh, so yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I think that there's a chance that during the regular season, things are going to go really well for the bucks. It is a matter of how is this team going to perform in the playoffs? And when you look at it and how it relates to the Philadelphia 76ers, it seems as though just based off of how the season's gone, uh, how the East has shaken out current standings, the Sixers and the bucks are on a path to, meeting potentially in the second round of the playoffs. And it will be the first time that they've met in the playoffs in some time, uh, which is surprising to say after there's so many times the Sixers have just gotten stuck against the Heat and the Celtics. Uh, but they seem to be on that path to face the Bucks, And if they do face the Bucks in the second round, that might be the most watched playoff series in Philadelphia basketball since the 2001 finals. I just think that the fans are going to be completely engaged. They are going to, I mean, the the whole center is going to be packed. I don't know if you remember, but Ben Simmons first came back with the Brooklyn Nets and, and and they display every game. They do display most every game, at least they do display the code of conduct. Very clear on the Jumbotron, all over the place, they display the NBA's code of conduct. I swear that they put that code of conduct up at least 20 more times the night that Ben Simmons came back for his return because of the way <laughs> that fans were chirping the entire game. It was, it. I honestly, I will never forget that game for that specific reason, just how active the fans and the crowds were and it felt like every five minutes, the NBA's code of conduct's popping back up because you heard somebody start a chant. 
that is not quite a family friendly chant. So for Doc Rivers' return, and again, I think this is going to be the same case for when the Clippers eventually do come to Philadelphia for that one game. But a playoff series against Doc Rivers, uh, you can times that by by a thousand, basically. So uh, I think it is something that is definitely going to be interesting. I am looking forward to uh, listening to Doc speak on his first game when he does come to Philadelphia, February twenty fifth, Bucks in Philly. So definitely be sure to stop by that game. Uh, but will be definitely a great time. I, if Doc Rivers somehow knocks the Sixers out of the playoffs, I don't know how this fan base would. I have would seen people that. haunted already by that possibility. That was actually one of my <laughs> first responses um, when I when I, it was the Doc like is the leading candidate. I was like, oh my goodness, yeah. there's never been a better time to have Giannis first and beat in the playoffs. Uh, for yeah, that to be the the one of the main storylines. It would just be, it would be the most refreshing way for the Sixers to get into the conference finals for the, for the fans perspective, or it would be the most painful second round exit yet. Well, you you talked about the NBA being a soap opera first, and this is just right up that alley. It's completely perfect for the narrative, for the storylines. And and there could not have been a better edition of the script in this case. So uh, definitely interesting for, for Sixers fans. Uh, it is kind of crazy how their choices have either been getting ousted by Al Horford, getting ousted by Jimmy Butler, or potentially now, if it is, getting ousted by Doc Rivers. I, I, I don't know how Sixers fans would deal with that. Not that I'm exactly worried about that. I already thought the Sixers matched up very well with this, specifically this Bucks team. Uh, even still, I think Nick Nurse is at least the best coach in the Eastern Conference. Uh, and they've had a huge impact. He's had a huge impact on the team, obviously. Maxie's playing the best basketball of his life, and Bede's playing the best basketball of his life. I think Nick Batum's playing the best basketball of his life in, in a, a renaissance of, of a wonderful career. He has evolved into yet another stage, but we can talk about Nick Batum for another hour. We could go on for it, and we probably will on one edition of this pod sooner rather than later. But <laughs> Doc Rivers, man, back in the I- NBA, back coaching and it's just this there's, there's there's gotta be it still doesn't exactly feel real in a sense uh but i i think this is also good for bucks fans I, I i do think that as much as you know we can laugh about like certain things considering the context in philadelphia and all that uh at, at the end of the day it should be thought of as an upgrade over adrian griffin because uh, simply put that's that is what it is it is an upgrade yeah, but before speculating on um, <clears throat> what I think Doc will have the Bucks do, not to nitpick I, your point that Nurse is definitely one of the top coaches in the conference. Would you say he's better than Eric Spolstra, or were you just kind of making the general point that he is one of the best? Uh, I, this year, I, I would say so. I mean, Spolstra okay. has has the longevity. Uh, when we look With at this the specific Nick that Nurse had, job, correct? Yeah. So saying. we have to okay. get all okay. the context. We have to look at at the work he's done this year with the roster that he's been able, you know, who, who he has helped improve in certain specific areas. Like if we're looking at the entire body of work, obviously Eric Spolstra is the top coach in the Eastern conference. And he's just been rewarded with that lovely new contract reflecting that body of work that he's put together. But as far yes. as performance this season, I think that Nick nurse has done wonders for this Sixers roster. Part of it also helps that the Sixers roster is better than Miami's roster. So if we're talking about Spolstra, you know, you have to consider that as well. But just the growth that we've seen in Joel, in Tyrese, in Nick Batum, in De'Anthony Melton. De'Anthony Melton's seen a lot of growth as well. But, like, top to bottom, this roster, except for, unfortunately, Paul Reed, most of this roster is better than it was last season. And 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 Paul Reed can easily turn that around as well. But uh, most of this roster from top to bottom is, is easily better. And I think that Philadelphia did – improve their coaching situation based on what they needed. And I don't necessarily mean that as a slight against Doc, but just for what Philadelphia needed most, they clearly got the right man for the job. And Nick Nurse has been fantastic throughout the first half of the season. I hear you there for sure. Nurse has done a a very, very good job with the Sixers. Um, And yeah, the addition by subtraction of the Bucks fire and Griffin, a lot of Bucks fans immediately saw that, like, oh, well, you're bringing in Doc. Like, what's the change going to be? And 
like you mentioned, he is a player's coach. Players, you know, generally speak pretty highly of him. Um, Embiid, I know, was thought very highly of him. Um, so we'll, we'll see what kind of relationship he can make on the fly with Giannis and Dame. Um, just thinking about, you know, I can't speak too much on what the Bucks have done this season, but I would imagine that Doc is just going to, you know, not to put this in a mean way, but like make things simple. And sometimes the simple things are just very easy. And, you know, it's, it's easy to look at, for example, all the things the Sixers have going on offense this year, all the way that in the ways in beat and maxi attack in their two man game, all the off ball stuff that helps uh, open up other looks for other guys and keeps the defense occupied on the other side while they're trying to cook. Um, that's obviously kind of more apparent. Whereas Doc simply allowing Harden and Embiid to do their two-man game pick and roll, that doesn't seem like as much of coaching as the X's and O's stuff that Nick Nurse puts in seemingly every possession down the court. But it is at least some level of like, you know, for as impressive as you may think it is, or you, you know, you may think it's not that impressive at all, allowing that partnership to flourish is something that, you know, it happened under Doc Rivers' watch. And I imagine that he's going to do something similar with Giannis and Dame, just letting those guys do their thing, uh, you know, just going to that pick and roll constantly. And the Milwaukee has the shooters to space the floor, give them that space. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how, you know, it should be really good, obviously. That was one of the first things, seeing, you know, one of the best at attacking the rim and Giannis, one of the best shooters in Dame, should make for a very good pairing. And I think, again, any coach could do well with, with them. And obviously Adrian Griffin for all his faults had them at 30 and 13, which is fantastic. So I think doc will recognize like, Hey, let's just go to our two stars all the time. And the level of adjustments he may or may not make will be the determining factor of how far the bucks go. But I think that should help, you know, establish a more, you know, general hierarchy and just having the two stars do their thing defensively, um, you know, obviously be different. The bucks have gone to, you know, drop coverage a lot in the past and using Brooke Lopez and Giannis, like having them on the back line is huge. Um, like we've mentioned, the perimeter defensive personnel in the Bucks is very shaky. So we'll see what, you know, if Doc is willing to go to a guy like Andre Jackson or Marjan Bochamp or, you know, two, uh, two good young athletes who can defend, you know, we'll see obviously the track record with Doc and playing young guys is not great. Philly fans saw that up close and personal, but um I mean, listen, for all the faults of the Bucks, and it's the, the track record of teams firing their coach midseason and winning the championship is very small. Um, but I do – it would not surprise me if the Bucks retain their status and if, you know, Doc isn't as abrasive personality-wise as Griffin appeared to be, then they should be at least, you know, not make this season a total laugher. Yeah, I don't think that they're going to make this season a laugher, and I think especially during the regular season that they're going to see uh, – I would say a, a decent to large level of success. Uh, Doc, you talk about him kind of simplifying things. And, and one way that I'm interpreting that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you know Doc is, is very good at making a strong uh, initial plan. And, yeah, he kind of spams it sometimes, but oftentimes it works. I mean, we saw that with Harden and Embiid last season. Uh, and that was really kind of the you know precursor to – uh, you know, the less evolved stage to what we're seeing with Maxi and Embiid this season. And and part of that goes back even further to the two-man game that we saw with J.J. Redick, with Seth Curry, everything such as that. Uh, but can he run something similar with Giannis and Dame, uh, or, or at, at least in a similar sense where they have their go-to that they're constantly running? Yeah, absolutely he can. And I think that they are going to see a lot of great regular season success behind that. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Bucks still finish at the second spot in the East uh, behind the Boston Celtics, who I do expect to win the Eastern Conference. But uh, I, I think that the two, three spot, it, it could be a toss up between Philadelphia and Milwaukee. But I don't think Milwaukee's chances of finishing second in the East have gone down after the hiring of Doc Rivers. I think that they, if anything, have gone up because he is certainly, I agree. again, for all the wards, he is absolutely an improvement over Adrian Griffin. Yeah, I think um, Derek Bodden over at PHLY Sports, uh, who also missed the Embiid 70 game, so at least there's one other person who shares the uh, the regret that you feel. Put I it, commiserated I with him nice. on Twitter about it, yeah. Oh, uh, there you go. I think 
I'm pretty sure it was him who put it nicely that Doc is a, um, you know, he raises the floor. Apologies if I'm like misattributing this, but like Doc can put a team at a level where they can, you know, have a certain fine level of success and that team will, you know, perform admirably. And, you know, even just thinking back to the Sixers last year, obviously with their success this year, it's different to look back at, but there was so much excitement around how that team played. Got off to a rough start, but then they were one of the very best offenses in the league, and there was a lot of faith around that team. And obviously, the playoffs happened, and they still came as close as they ever have to advancing to the conference finals. But the accumulation of not being able to, you know, outgun the Celtics after they made the switch to, uh, I believe it was Rob Williams in the starting lineup, that kind of sunk them. And I can see a very similar script happening with Milwaukee. It obviously helps that they've got a good record. I mean, they're not going to miss the playoffs, but they still will be in a favorable spot to have their first round, have home court advantage in the first round, which will get them to the second round. And then that's kind of where, much like the Sixers, is where Doc, at least in recent memory, has been. You know, it's always sink or swim, and his teams have constantly sunk. So whoever Milwaukee gets, wherever they end up, that will be the the question to see like what happens there. And I agree that it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sad state of affairs when Doc Rivers is an upgrade over the coach. And like you had mentioned, it would have been better if Milwaukee just went elsewhere. Um, yeah. You know, I think Milwaukee learned the hard way, kind of maybe like how the Sixers did with Embiid that letting a player choose the coach isn't always the best way to go. No, it, it, it frankly isn't. But one thing that I kind of want to go back to what you just said is talking about their, their first round matchup. And looking at the standings, what's particularly interesting is that the team that they're currently set to match up against, assuming that seeding falls exactly as it is, you know, a play-in tournament goes as expected, all that stuff. The Indiana Pacers, the Indiana Pacers are currently lined up to be their first round uh, opponent. And the Pacers pre-Siakam trade, have been a great team to watch against the Milwaukee Bucks. And now they've added Pascal Siakam into the mix as well. Uh, That is not going to be an easy series if you are Milwaukee. Now the other team to watch there are the Miami Heat, who are the sixth seed with the same record as the Indiana Pacers. Either way, that's not going to be fun if it's one of those two teams. Now, Cleveland can always fall down a little bit. I think that's kind of what most people are expecting. Uh, you know, the New York Knicks probably will hit land at some point and come down from, from this post OG and OB high that they are currently on. We shall see. But they're going to have to face the East is deep. They're going to have to face one of these tougher teams. And if Milwaukee is is not ready top to bottom, including the coaching staff, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it, it is possible that you're looking at another first round exit once again. You know, so getting that top seed is is obviously key. Uh, Boston fans, I'm sure, are excited about that prospect right now. Just three and a half games up. I mean, anything can always happen. We haven't even been past the deadline yet, so who knows what additions the Bucks or the Sixers make. Buyout market's coming too. Now the Bucks, because of the new CBA, it's a little bit more difficult for them to add anybody. But the Sixers could add at least a piece or two. We're hearing about a couple out of Charlotte at least that could be made available past the deadline. Uh, yeah, no, there is still room to overtake Boston. But whoever gets that top seed, it's, there's going to be a dogfight for it because teams are not going to want to face – I mean, Cleveland less so, but – they're not going to want to face Indiana. They're not going to want to face Miami or New York if they somehow fall down to that to that seventh spot, even the six, because the Sixers currently matched up against the Miami Heat. Not a cakewalk itself either. So when, while I do have faith in this Philadelphia team over Miami, because, again, I think that the roster has clearly been better. I think that Nick Nurse this season, just looking at this season's body of work, has done a better job than Eric Spolstra. I'm confident in that series, but you still you, you always got to look at Miami a little sideways when you get in the playoffs because they have constantly exceeded expectations. And when I'm talking about the job that Nurse has done over Spolster this season, again, we've only seen the regular season. Playoff Spo, just like playoff Jimmy Butler, is a whole different animal. So 
Uh, it's not going to be fun for any team that faces off against Indiana or Miami. Basically, the playoffs are just not going to be fun for anybody except for the top seed. So uh, definitely really interesting right now what's going on in the Eastern Conference. But for now, preparing for this five-game road trip for the Philadelphia 76ers. A little bit of a break from us going down in the center, but definitely going to be watching along the whole time, seeing what Embiid can do next to top uh, the performances that he's done in the past. D'Anthony Mountain expected to rejoin the lineup at some point during this five-game road trip. Possibly in about a week he's going to get reevaluated. I know we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that tonight, but that is exciting that he is nearing potentially the light at the end of that tunnel. And yeah, so five-game road trip for the Sixers. Let's see what they can do next. Currently, uh, winning streak is at six, I believe. Am I right, Sam? Yep. Uh, no, it's yeah. not exciting. No, it's not exciting. It's 10 straight. Three straight games at 10 yeah. o'clock at night start time. Oh, that's Portland, yeah. This Golden, is... Portland, Golden State, and Utah, which was just bumped up uh, yeah. to end that road trip. At least there's a nice, you know, 5.30 Saturday uh, early evening game against Denver, which should be very fun, and the 7 yeah. o'clock start time against Indiana. But, yeah, those 10 o'clock games are always quite tough. Um, Western Conference road trip on a back the, to back the bane of an East. Monday, Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> Woo! Back to back in the middle of the week, yeah. Uh, Western Conference road trip is Let's the go. bane of an East Coast beat reporter's existence. So, uh, yeah, no, it'll be fun. This is the grind. This is the life that we have chosen. Do not mourn us. We are here for you. So, again, Sam, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And going forward, again, super excited to have you on as a new member of this family. Here, it's still processing. Justin will be back. Uriah will be back. Andy will be back. Uh, we're just only making additions here. No subtractions here. It's still processing. We only roll forward just like the Sixers team. So, uh, again, thank we're you so much for listening. Here. We are winning the trade <laughs> deadline. <laughs> Listen, this is a major opportunity. And even if it's not some blockbuster addition that people are expecting, there's a lot of good that can be done around the margins too. And I think that people need to be willing to be excited about those types of moves as well because – this team is far better than I think anyone expected, but there is still there's room to improve in very simple ways, which is exciting because that makes it tangible, that makes it real, that makes it attainable. So this team is going to be entering the trade deadline with a very realistic path to actually improving, which not every team always has at the trade deadline. And so for a trade machine junkie like myself, it's super exciting because we're talking about everybody from DeLon Wright to Royce O'Neal to DeJounte Murray, who it does seem like the Sixers are stepping back from a little bit. But no matter where they land, listen, this is going to be an exciting time. And you're probably looking at, I would say, just likely considering the past history, considering the assets available, possibly looking at multiple players coming on in at this trade deadline. So it's going to be super exciting for the Sixers fans. But once again, thank you so much for uh, listening to our episode today. Thank you for watching along. Be sure to follow Still Processing on Twitter at ProcessingPod76. Definitely give Sam D. Giovanni a follow as well at by Sam D. Giovanni on Twitter. I'm at Chavo NBA, of course. Check out our stuff on PSN. Check out Sam's stuff on Clutch Points. I'm going to hawk every other little bit of thing that I can here. So be sure to watch, to listen. This Sixer season is. It's a treat, honestly, for the fans so far. Hopefully it stays that way. But thank you again so much for listening. I do appreciate it. Once again, I've been Zach Chavalella here with Sam G. Giovanni, who, just like myself, just like Justin, just like all of you, is still processing.